I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Before I go further, I'd like to say a word about that meditation um, in particular. You may have started to sense or been sensing from the, from the start uh, a kind of impersonal sense of stillness, spaciousness, and um, benevolence, kindness, that, as I said, seemed impersonal. It's almost like you're entering into something that's present already. And um, the growing identification with or uh, trust in those underlying qualities of stillness, peacefulness, spaciousness, and, and uh, benevolence, goodwill, good wishes, uh, that can be really helpful for people. Uh, you don't have to believe anything. It's more like you just kind of notice, wow, what's it like to be you when the mind comes to rest? More and more, it's, it's as if we're, um, it's not a big blank. It's not a big numbness. Rather, it's a really profound sense of um, stillness, peacefulness, that is spacious, vast, and aware, and um, but benevolent, wishes to, to give, to help, rather than to take or to hurt. And for some, uh, that is, a, is an inkling or a a way in which that which could be ultimately transcendental uh, is, is apparent in this world. You don't have to believe or disbelieve anything like that. It's more I'm just kind of calling out qualities that you may have encountered in your own experience. When it gets quieter and, and you're okay. So I'd like to explore with you something that's extremely alive for me. And because it's very fresh, I, I don't have my usual seven point plan. What a relief. And I, I invite you in this reflection along with me, this exploration really, along with me. It has sort of three of course, me would have three parts, right? But it has a kind of, you know, aspects to it. Um, to start with, I've been um, <clears throat> just recently reflecting on the word dedicate. Dedication, to dedicate oneself. What are we dedicated toward? Uh, I looked up the Latin roots of the word. It, basically means to, to speak or to declare yourself uh, towards something. Okay, but what does it mean deeper than that? And I, I kind of invite you right now to, to ask yourself, huh, what am I dedicated to? So, it, so think of dedication as it involves sincerity. You know, you're, you're, you're honest with yourself about it. Um, it does not mean perfection. It's, it's very lovely the ways in which the moral precepts in Buddhism are held. They're held not as commandments uh, or absolutes. They're held as, as explorations, as undertakings. Uh, the traditional vow is essentially, I undertake the training precept too fill in the blank, to abstain from killing living things, living beings, to 
I undertake the training precept to um, not take that which is not freely offered, for example. So we're, dedication is something we're moving toward with sincerity. It doesn't mean we're perfect. We can rededicate ourselves to it if we fall short. And it has a sense of importance. So you might like to ask yourself, huh, what, what are you dedicated to that matters to you? What are you dedicated to already? Sometimes we dedicate ourselves to things that are um, not, uh, not good for us, maybe over time, or we tried really hard, but it just didn't turn out. You know, we dedicated ourselves maybe to, uh, to a, a business or a nonprofit or to a relationship. We really gave ourselves to it. And maybe we, some people have dedicated themselves to teachers who um, abused that dedication and exploited it, misused it, uh, did not honor it appropriately. And sometimes we get burned around what we've dedicated to. And then we avoid being dedicated altogether. Sometimes that can happen. In the Buddhist tradition, and you see this in other traditions as well, uh, there is a recognition of a kind of range of dedication. There are people who are curious, who are interested, but they're not particularly dedicated to a path. Uh, by the way, it's possible to be dedicated to multiple paths. Uh, I would say I'm dedicated to the inquiry and the, the collection of tools in clinical psychology. I'm, I'm also dedicated to the um, exploration and findings of science, including the, the life sciences, biology, neuroscience. And I'm also dedicated to contemplative practice and a, and a path of awakening. And to me, these dedications are not mutually exclusive. I'm, I'm also dedicated to my family and, and I feel quite dedicated to um, helping humanity and uh, grow out of this kind of bardo it's been in for 10,000 years that has looked a lot like Game of Thrones for most people, most times. So we can be dedicated to multiple things. I know people who are quite dedicated to the combination, the intersection of Zen practice and Theravada and Southeast Asian practice. So it's not necessarily, you know, uh, it doesn't mean you're a dilettante if you're dedicated to multiple things. So you might ask yourself, huh, what am I dedicated to? And what's your relationship to dedication? Like, can you be overly dedicated to something or underly <laughs> dedicated to something? And can you find ways to be dedicated to your family or to, to other things in, in ways that do not involve craving? I mean, there is this interesting combination in certainly the Buddhist tradition, uh, going all the way back to early Buddhism, original Buddhism, as best we gather it um, from the Pali Canon and other sources of the uh, earliest surviving written records of what the Buddha thought and taught. Uh, there's this combination of a seriousness. It can come across as a finger wagging sometimes, like, pay attention, <laughs> uh, get real, you're going to die someday, <laughs> get with it. You know, you have that quality that calls for dedication, including in lay practitioners, um, while at the same time being very careful about craving, right? How do we be dedicated without craving? It's a real art. And I think... Um, 
aspects of that um, combination of dedication without craving involve a quality of being carried along by your dedication, carried along by your purpose, carried along by the virtue in it, the goodness in it. You're carried along by it rather than driving yourself towards some goal. It feels really quite different. Sometimes we might be in a combination of the two, but they're really quite different. Uh, you know, I, I'm re reminded of a comment uh, from Sokni Rinpoche with regard a great Tibetan teacher regarding uh, Ajahn Amaro, uh, a, a great Theravadan teacher who's, uh, I think, an uh, abbot now of um, Amaravati Monastery, I think, in England at this today. Um, in any case, uh, Sokni Rinpoche, in a Tibetan tradition that maybe is looser in its forms than... Theravadan monasticism. And Sokhti Rinpoche just laughed. He said, you know, uh, Ajahn Amaro is just completely surrendered to his precepts. He's completely com dedicated to them while holding them completely lightly and being free in his relationship to them. That combination so here too, you might ask yourself, okay, the things that I'm loyal to in my life, I'm dedicated to them, maybe even dedicated you know, to my practice or to certain causes or to people. You know, I, I have friends, I'm, I'm really quite dedicated to their welfare, I'm, I'm loyal to them. Hmm, has craving, has contraction, has pressure, has intensity, has demand, has righteousness, ooh, you know, slipped in to some of your dedication, particularly to the people you love most. Ooh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm calling myself on this too. So that's good, good background around dedication. And then there's a particular kind of dedication that becomes increasingly foregrounded as historically Buddhism spread through northern India and then spread out um, up through Tibet into China and then over to Japan, uh, a dedication to the awakening of others. Uh, if you um, uh, certainly in, in early Buddhism, there's a strong emphasis on the third jewel of the Sangha, the community. Uh, there's certainly a strong emphasis on not harming others and um, an emphasis certainly on loving kindness and, and compassion, really important. There's an appreciation of the ways in which, uh, you know, sort of immeasurable, exalted states of being involve um, kindness and compassion and caring for the welfare of others grounded in equanimity, the Brahma Viharas. There's an awareness of that, but it's still pretty aimed at individual awakening with the, um, you know, the ultimate aim uh, in early Buddhism being the Arahant, uh, one, who, uh, in, one who is so developed that uh, the three poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion or ignorance uh, cannot in any way, shape, or form take root or manifest in that being's mind. It's completely absent, greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, but the frame there is individual, the individual. And then with the development of the Mahayana tradition, uh, the ideal of the bodhisattva came forward, someone who's certainly very far along in practice, but who... Uh, uh, renounces uh, complete awakening in a frame of um, belief that with complete awakening, the causes of rebirth have no are no longer present. So there's no longer a, some kind of continuation from life to life to life. And you don't have to agree with that or believe it, but that's the frame of reference. And so 
here is someone who is very far along, a bodhisattva, who chooses to be reborn and subject to illness, aging, death, and the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and all the rest of it, chooses to undertake all that for the sake of bringing others to full awakening. So, so we have a dedication. Now I'm speaking in kind of the second part of my talk here. Um, we have a dedication to the awakening of others. And we have forms of that dedication uh, that some you may have been exposed to in which people dedicate the merit that otherwise would accrue to oneself, merit in this life or future lives. Uh, one dedicates the merit of, one pract of one's practice to others. Ah, and then we see, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism, practices in, of Tonglen and others in which we take on to ourselves the suffering of others for the sake of their liberation. With the understanding pragmatically that consistent with the teachings in early Buddhism of the Buddha that emphasize a lot the release of the self-contraction. You know, that point out that selfing is a major factor in craving. Of course, craving is a major factor in selfing. The two go together often. And so if one really dedicates oneself to the liberation, the awakening of others, that outwardly focused um, generosity really reduces the self-contraction, which wonderfully, pragmatically, aids in the awakening of the, of the beings who are dedicating themselves to the welfare of others. Okay. And it's really interesting to ask yourself, and you just kind of pick a person, maybe a person you're in a relationship with, a person you live with, uh, could be a person you work with, and just kind of um, rest deliberately, kind of focus on, huh, what am I dedicated to in you? You know, am I dedicated to your own welfare? To, to your own well-being, you know? Is there, is a f maybe a less fancy way to put that is something like, am I committed to kindness as my default with the other person? Maybe it's just out of reach because they're being so obnoxious. I get that in the, in the moment, or really horrible. Okay, I'm not talking about edge cases where, you're, you know, you're you're running for your life or someone's attacking you. I'm talking about, you know, kind of ordinary range situations. Uh, you could do it with people that you know well. It's really interesting to do this with people you don't know so well. Like I can look at some of the faces here in the Zoom, you know, thumbnails and see a name. And I can ask myself, huh, can I locate a sincere dedication to a person I'm seeing on the screen right now in which I really wish them well. And I have, I have skin in the game. There's, there's traction. There's um, intent in my commitment to their welfare. It doesn't mean I'm giving up myself. I'm not becoming codependent. I'm not being a doormat. But I'm actually aware of them over there and a kind of presence in them behind their face, behind their eyes, uh, un behind their personality, underneath their personality, that, ah, it's true in my heart that my heart cares for that. Huh? It's really quite interesting to ask yourself, what's real for you in these good wishes for others? And what happens inside you when you shift out of a kind of typical, especially in Western culture, um, self-aggrandizing, you know, self-referential, uh, doing it for yourself, and 
by yourself, for yourself. And kind of shifting out of that into a, oh, for you. That it goes way beyond some kind of Hallmark card cliche to profound teaching of the great teachers, many of the great teachers in our lineage, broadly. And you can imagine comparable teachings uh, in um, other great traditions in the world and even secular teachings, you know. Uh, so then to go to the third step here, and then, then we'll open it up, including, um, you know, difficult cases, or what do you actually mean, Rick? You know, that's what I like to explore with you. In other words, I'm talking about, we're exploring here, a really big topic in Buddhism, you know, including its historical shift from the, a focus on one's own realization to a focus uh, that, it's a, that includes uh, really, really, committing to and being dedicated to the realization of others. So um, the third step draws on a very interesting technique that comes out of Tibet um, in which we explore what it's like to uh, regard uh, the person as uh, having been someone that we really cherished or regarding some aspect of that other person way down deep as something that, wow, I've really cherished or who has done a lot for me. The classic form of this in a, in a frame in Tibetan Buddhism that uh, is strongly centered in the doctrine or cosmology of endless cycles of births is the notion that this other person has been your mother in a previous life. Now, you don't have to necessarily believe in that whole cosmology. Um, it's just kind of imagining that this person, including someone who's like, a bully right now or someone difficult for you uh, or just you know a, a kind of a casual acquaintance even was was someone that way behind your personality you have really cared about so that you're you're centered in bodhicitta bodhicitta the you know citta is consciousness broadly, sometimes translated as mind, other times translated as heart, uh, citta. And bodhi is uh, the root of the word for Buddha. You know, it's, uh, it's the knowing uh, without ignorance, without delusion, without illusion, uh, knowing. So, and particularly in that knowing, there's a natural benevolence. Uh, so bodhicitta is the mind or heart of wise benevolence. We could describe it that way. So what's it really like to just kind of rest in and play around with this person who might be really annoying right now? Um, was way back when, maybe in, an, in another life or in some mysterious way in this life, uh, someone who you cherished, someone who really was beautiful towards you. If only as a, like a little trick you do in your mind, it can really, 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 um, you know, have a, a wonderful effect. And it's a method, it's a technique that's highly uh, emphasized, certainly in Tibetan Buddhism. So to sum up, and then let's open it up for questions, what ifs, what abouts, yes buts. Um, so 
<clears throat> I've spoken here in this exploration about dedication. What are you dedicated to? Um, have you been burned in your dedication so that you're avoiding dedication maybe, but actually you could be served by giving yourself over to the sincerity and wholesomeness of appropriate dedications? Can you be dedicated without the contraction and pressure and me, me, me of craving? Uh, so that was part one of my presentation. Part two was um, to consider dedication to uh, the welfare and even the awakening of other beings. What happens when that happens for you? What's that like? Maybe you're already really doing that in your practice, as many are. Um, in the Vipassana, insight, Theravadan, mindfulness-focused uh, forms of Western Buddhism that I've mainly had a background in, and a lot of us have had some background in, that emphasis on being committed to the awakening of others is, is, is latent at most. It's in the background. It's often unsaid. Uh, it, it's really been foregrounded in Tibetan Buddhism, Chan, and, and Zen, especially, yeah, I would say that. And so what's that like for you to be dedicated to the awakening of others and also really to the welfare of others? You know? And can you... In other words, and can we explore, as I am um, these days, this combination of really letting yourself feel your your dedication to their welfare and in compassion and kindness, while at the same time taking care of yourself and not being taken advantage of. That's part two. And then in part three, I put on the table the really interesting practice of kind of imagining or sensing that behind the personality or under the personality, beneath the words of this other person, there's some process over there. There's some beingness uh, that is worthy of, of cherishing and caring deeply about. Maybe because that beingness over there really cherished you in some way. If only playing with it as like a trick or imagining it, what effect does that have? And further, huh, what if, <laughs> as a wild card, what if <laughs> those wacky people were right and wow, this neighbor, this coworker, this, you know, ex, this child of mine, wow, what if in a previous life of, in some way, they really went out of their way for me. Really came through for me, like a mother or father would. Wow. What happens when you kind of play around with that? Okay. So those are the three parts of my talk. Let me see what... I see a lot of really interesting comments here about different things. Uh, I think that like so many things, what's important is to bring it down to actual practice. Like for me, when I do this little practice with someone, I, particularly I'll, I'll, I'll do it in general, but it, it's really useful if, if they're being a little, or you're feeling a little exasperated or maybe a lot, or something has happened, or there's some awkwardness with them, or they're droning on, you know, you want, you want to get away, <laughs> anything, you know, huh, what's it like to be dedicated to their welfare? I think you'll notice that your suffering will diminish dramatically, actually, and uh, you'll be able to act more skillfully with that other person. Okay, so let's just see if there's anything here. Yeah, so Mary Lynn asks a key question, classic. Um, 12 minutes past. Yes, I've been burned, especially in family relationships. I've tried to show goodwill, dedication, but what's the line between turning the other cheek versus being a doormat? It's a great question. Uh, 
So for one, I think often we can be in situations in which we really have strong intentions uh, toward the welfare of others. We really do. We're very determined uh, toward their welfare, and there's nothing we can do about it. The causes and conditions are not present for us to manifest that intention, to uh, manifest that dedication in outer forms. It's just not available to us. So maybe we're with someone who's a family member or other people, and in deep in our heart, we've, we've moved out of the war with them in our mind, in our heart. And we really do have a fundamentally uh, good intentions toward them. And there's no way that they will receive those good intentions. So we disengage as best we can. There's not a should here. We're, we're not trying to um, make something that cannot happen. And, and that's a, this is a really important point. In difficult relationships, one of the most useful uh, themes is to be clear about where you can take refuge. What do you take refuge in? And one of the key refuges is knowing your good intent currently, whatever the past has been, knowing your good intent currently. That's an incredibly important refuge. And also, um, knowing that you've done what you can. There are no more stones to turn over. You've played your cards. You've shot your wad. You've done what you can. And um, it could be tomorrow. There's more you could do. But as far as what you can do as of now, you've done it. And you could take refuge in that. So sometimes with people that uh, we're dedicated to, in, in the sense here, there's a limit. There's a bound. And it's okay. So... We're not being treated, we're not being a doormat with them. Uh, you know, I have um, in my broad extended family system, there are people that I absolutely wish well. I have no, there's no uh, punishing impulse in me toward them, even though, you know, they've really wronged me. And, and also, you know, maybe they don't want contact with you right now. But still, you can be at peace about that. These, these are refuges that are really, really useful, particularly in intense, significant relationships. All right. So I see a couple of hands up. Uh, hands are gone. I see Leslie has raised her hand. I'm going to be very, I want to, so if I talk with someone, I see multiple people. I really ask you to be succinct, okay, uh, so that others stick around. All right, so Janet, we'll just start with you. What's your question that's succinct and of general interest? I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. Good job. You did up. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. Good. Actually, um, I can be pretty succinct, but I think I'm a good example of everything you've talked about this evening in that my only son became an opiate addict and I had to both do everything I could to support him, mm. including multiple, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple treatment programs and financial mm. assistance and yeah. Paying his rent and bailing him out of jail and paying for attorneys and okay, and realizing that none of that could help. Yeah. So stepping back, um, it's been years now, and he's continued to decline. But yeah. I found Buddhism and I found mindfulness. Yeah. And I found the teachings and the things you're talking about tonight that allowed me to realize that mm. 
I am separate from him. I send him metta all day long, every day. Mm -hmm. But this is a situation that yeah. I can't have any impact on. Yeah. Last night, we okay. got a call from his former girlfriend saying he was going to the emergency room. Yeah. And so I have her number now, but he didn't call me. So, so all day, I let it go. This is how I can help him. You talked about how we can help others yeah. by our own growth and development. Mm -hmm. So because I'm able to let go of my ego, right. I can recognize that what's best for him, he didn't reach out to me. So Janet, I got it. Wow, what okay. a journey you've been okay. on. And like I said, I'm looking for questions here. And um, so, wow. And truly my heart goes out to you. I'm a parent too. What a, what a challenging, challenging thing. And I, I appreciated the points you made here. About I just hope that maybe somebody else who's in the same situation can yeah. see that you can get beyond it. Because oh, yeah. so thank my you. son in this experience was my teacher. So maybe it can teach someone else. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Maybe one more person here. So Leslie, asking you to unmute. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so my what if is this, uh, what if it truly is on the battlefield? So uh, I won't give a lot of detail about the situation, but uh, to say that, that there is a, 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 there are sides, there is a war uh, in the neighborhood and that can be generalized to say, you know, any war you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine, or wars of ideology, as um, if I may be frank, some Americans may be a little concerned about the upcoming election, and uh, you'll be perhaps be in situations where you feel that you're being bullied, lied yeah. to, uh, and it truly is. Um, so what's the question? What's the what if? The, 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 the question is uh, just, um, how it might be different when you're in the the battlefield uh as in you know if, if somebody's pointing a, a gun at you right so let me jump jump in here so here you are in a in the trenches the oatmeal is flying um one thing we can be dedicated toward is our own welfare and safety and in my experience as a longtime therapist particularly as many therapists too, working mainly uh, with uh, female identified people who tend to be socialized into being dedicated toward others and not toward themselves. One of the important things is to be dedicated to your own welfare and uh, to be first about it. And under certain conditions, I've been, you know, I've been fortunate as well as privileged to be able to avoid violence on the whole. Um, but there are conditions where a, a lot of things get really simple. <laughs> you know, you are dedicated to getting out of there. You are dedicated to fighting off your attacker, you know, by any means necessary. Uh, you're dedicated to protecting those you care about, those who are innocent, um, those who are in harm's way. It's really simple. So that's a kind of dedication too, I think. And um, I think also speaking of... <clears throat> authoritarianism and, and demagogues and tyrants of different kinds, uh, I think there's a place where we serve a lot of others by having the courage, you know, taking into account safety concerns, but having the courage to stand up to bullies and to be dedicated also to uh, truth-telling and a kind of fearless moral confidence in um, just simply stating matter-of-factly what is actually true and what our personal values are and um, and being very direct about that. I think that's a dedication too, right? And I think that, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, in, in this life, we've been served by so many people who, Rosa Parks, I'm just thinking about it, who'd had it up to here with having to sit in the back of the bus, um, great civil rights activist and being. Uh, so Greta Thunberg, she had it up to here 
as how old was she? 14 or something? Maybe younger? Younger? I don't know. She had it up to here with uh, going through the, 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 the gestures of going to school when, as far as she could tell, her planet was on a, the fast track to burning up and she'd had it up to here with the adults who had dropped the ball, right? So we can be dedicated to a lot of stuff that, that involves fierce advocacy um, as well, even in, as it were, the battlefield. Uh, I think what people I respect a lot talk about uh, is the importance of not letting hatred uh, invade the heart. That can be hard sometimes, you know? And uh, it's an exploration for me to retain moral clarity about people who are really doing harms in the world while not being um, captured or in the clench of craving, really, around the heart that moves into enmity, you know, enmity, hatred, uh, you know, wanting them to suffer. You know, whoa, that's a poison. We're very vulnerable to that one. I don't want to take that poison. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a chance here. I don't think I've spoken with you before. Ruby Marez, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Great. Okay, a question. Yes. How do you know when to end a relationship let's what's your process for thinking through when you still have love but it's <laughs> wow you mean a romantic one or a friend yes or a both, romantic or, or one. both yeah um well i don't know about your you know situation and you know all the rest of that it's an interesting question um so i've been in a relationship for a long time and you know i uh i'm not necessarily the best person so i here's what i look for a couple things. One, what's it feel like to be around this other person? Do you feel like you're kind of the best in you is coming out? Or do you feel you, you have to guard, you have to brace, you're contracted, or, or you always kind of feel smaller rather than larger after you've interacted with them? That's telling. A second thing that's really important is how do they handle repair? You know, can they repair? Or when you do skillful things, maybe you find the courage to stretch and put it out uh, and have a repair conversation with them. How do they treat that? If they, you know, wiggle a little and spew a little, but then gradually settle into repair, that's a really good sign. But if on the other hand, they blow off repair, uh, that's long-term almost impossible to have a significant relationship with someone who won't do some kind of normal range. Cultures vary, styles vary, men vary than women and vice versa, so forth, how they do repair, but still, will they do repair? That's another one. And then the another one I, I look to is, um, what's, what's the presence of you know, bad conflict or just wacky behavior, uh, significant drug abuse, um, just craziness, you know, gl glasses shattering, <laughs> doors slamming, whoa, stalking out in the middle of the night, you know, wow. And uh, then around all that, what's the learning curve? And what's the rate of learning? And I've seen people, you know, I've been a couples counselor a lot, who are really dedicated. They want to raise children. Maybe they're children together. Maybe they're, they've been together for a while. On any given day, it's not bad enough to leave. But the rate of change positive change, let's assume it's appropriate change, the rate of positive change in that other person is just not fast enough. It's pretty flat. And then a person makes a fateful decision. You know, the, my clock is ticking in this life. Sometimes my clock is ticking around maybe wanting to have children or maybe wanting to take a developmental step such as marriage or buying a house together or making a life together. And, you know, I'm just going to take a chance here and I'm going to walk away from a reliable but small rowboat. I'm going to swim away <laughs> in the hopes that I will find, um, you know, a, a more appropriate vehicle for where I want to go in this life. 
And, th and that's sometimes based on an estimate of how rapidly can that other person grow, you know, which often boils down to trying to promote growth and then see what, what happens. And then growing, of course, along the way. I would just say last, it's really important to make sure you're doing what I call unilateral virtue. You've done your part. So you've taken that off the table. Like you really have cleaned up your side of the street. You really are keeping your agreements. You really are practicing right speech. You really are, you know, regulating yourself in reasonable ways. You really are, um, have a, you know, a, a growth curve yourself, right? Uh, you really are delivering the goods. You're taking maximum reasonable responsibility for, for their complaints and their needs and the rest as you define maximum reasonable personal responsibility. You're doing that. And that then creates a clear field where you can really see the other person um, and creates the best odds that they'll rise to the occasion. And yet if they don't, that's really informative, sometimes poignantly so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My two cents at full speed as we finish up here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. So I, I, I hope this was useful for you. I mean, for me, these are really profound topics. Dedication, you know, sincerity, um, dedication to the welfare of others in appropriate ways, and um, getting in touch with some sense of a being, a being process, a beingness, way back there, way under there, or, or in another person that, that you can cherish. Right? You can really care about without giving up your own needs and rights. Those are three big topics that are classic topics, certainly in the spiritual world, and I think are full of practical value. Okay, thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>